let me just kind of start with uh, kind of a like kind of my canned view of what I think economists do, um, at least the kind of economist that I am. Um, you kind of start with this maintained model of human behavior. Like you can you can have people do lots of things, but you have to have them rationally pursuing objectives, and it's fine to assume that they have unlimited memory and computation. And you know, you, there's a lot of um, this kind of basic view of how people act kind of gets maintained across lots of research. And then, yeah, <laughs> no, no worries. I consent, it's fine. Uh, so then you, know, you have, then you have people who are economists of a certain type. So I'm a labor economist by training, so I think a lot about how people make human capital decisions, uh, how they apply for jobs, how they get hired, uh, all the, those kind of questions. And like the basic research program is, okay, well let's assume that I've got this person who rationally pursues their objectives. I design a little world for them where they face trade-offs and they have some kind of constraints and then I explore their behavior, right, in theory. But then ultimately I want to kind of compare this back to like what the actual humans do. All right, so this is, this is like I think kind of the, you know, basic research program. And, you know, a lot of the discussion about uh, language models, it kind of has some flavor of like, boy, these things can really do things that we thought of as uh, human only, right? They can do things that we thought, boy, that, that's really not something that um, we would have thought a computer can do. And so I, I was, you know, my, my kind of first thought when I sort of saw some of these enhanced capabilities was like, how can I use this personally to improve my research, right? Like, how, how can I take advantage of this? And so uh, I was struck by this idea, well, what happens if we take these things and put them and have them play the role of subjects in experiments? So, you know, empirical economists, you know, you put people in different, um, you know, give them surveys and have them play games or do all sorts of different things. What happens if we, we do that? Um, and if you do that, like how, you know, I'm not pressing this hard enough. I'll just Google. Um, Okay, so then let me modify this slide. We can then take and say, this is a beautiful model, but let's just set it aside for now. And say, instead of having to work out what rationality would demand, uh, I'm gonna turn this over to the language model. I'm gonna say, you get to, I'm gonna present the scenario to you and then I'm gonna see what you, you tell us is, is, is gonna be your decision or what you're gonna do. Um, and then we can take and then put this in these exciting new scenarios. So say, hey, you're someone looking for a job, or you're on a hiring committee, or you are uh, you know, the director of a firm and you're having to make like, capital decisions. Now, notice like, this doesn't touch the empirical research, and I wanna just be very, very clear. I'm not saying that it's possible to do a social science without people, like that's crazy. Uh, you still like, you need to go and see what do actual people do. But this first part where we kind of drive a lot of our insights by making toy models, exploring their implications, um, this could be a tool for this, if, if it works, right? And so, most of what I'm gonna talk about is just a, an example that this does work. Now you might just be saying, well look, <laughs> hey buddy, we've had agent-based models for a long time. The idea of like using simulation in the social sciences is not, is not new. Uh, and I, I completely, completely buy that, but I think what is different uh, is that one, uh, I think a lot of criticism of agent-based models is that the researcher gets to decide what their behavior is. Like you get to say, hey, this is how you're gonna play the game. And that feels a little bit like cheating, like you have a card up your sleeve or something. Like it's, it's, it's like, how, how exactly did you get to this point? I, I think, uh, you know, economists, I think a lot of the reason they like so-called toy models or simple models is because they can trace out exactly how you got from A to B. Now, you lose that with, with language models. Like, we don't know exactly why they could do the certain thing that they do. But the fact that we don't get to program, it takes away a sort of researcher degree of freedom, is actually a plus, somewhat, somewhat um, oddly. The other thing is, they're pro they can be programmed, I'm using this very, very loosely, in natural language and interact in natural language. And this just kind of radically simplifies setting these things up, right? Where I'm not kind of going through and kind of, 
you know, uh, write some bad Python about what you're going to do in certain situations. I just have this kind of general interface uh, to these agents. And you can absolutely, you know, let them talk to each other. I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but uh, it was useful for me to kind of say, like, well, what are all the things that kind of suck about being a conventional social scientist and having to work with real people? And if you could make this work, you know, what, what would let you do this? So, you know, speed. If I want to do some study, there's like this long kind of setup and I have to like think about how I'm going to recruit people and talk to the IRB. Expense, like dealing with real people is as expensive as real people are, right? I mean, if you kind of think about everyone here, like what's your labor market options? Like this is an extremely expensive conference. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's great, it's great. I mean, I'm glad we're doing it, but like real people is, is challenging. And so, you know, related to this, it, this is a kind of a common critique of a lot of like lab econ stuff is you get this weird selection of people. Like, you know, undergraduates who their time isn't worth that much. No, no offense to undergraduates. But like, you know, come in and have them play games. But if your research question was like, how do CEOs make decisions? Um, you, know, they, you know, they're not gonna like join your survey and like to win an iPad. Like they don't, you know, they, you know it's, it's like it's hard to study that, that population. Um, the other thing, and I don't have to tell a room full of game theorists this, but like people respond strategically, right? So even if you, even if you, you know, create a survey, um, you know, you, you, get, you get people kind of <laughs> telling what, you, what, what, what they think, you can absolutely get AI agents to stage whisper to you and tell you what they're really thinking. And I mean, it's very easy to set them up like in a bargaining scenario and they will lie to their opponent, um, but you can ask them privately, what do you, you, know, what do you really think? I think the other thing, um, you know, as an, and as an empiricist primarily, um, most projects you do, you get to some point after you've collected the data or designed the experiment, and you're like, oh crap, we should have asked this, or we should have added a cell that did this, or here's this critique that the reviewers brought up that we really can't address. To the extent that you can take and sort of rewind a scenario very easily and try something different is really, really powerful, I, I think. So if, if this worked, the ability to kind of do research first in simulation and then go into the real world, I think that piloting power uh, could be particularly powerful. Yes, Jason. You had a slide earlier where you said you still have to talk to people eventually. Yes. Can you justify <laughs> that statement? <laughs> because here's the, here's the point. I mean, we're finding that these models are doing a better and better job of things that we care about doing. And also, as the CEO of all these companies, I don't like spending my time on these tasks either. So I'm happy to delegate to a good enough model to make decisions for me. And so now, why do you have to talk to people? <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm enough of a coward that I'm like, I don't want everyone in empirical econ to hate me and tell them that like, their, their job is, but, but. I don't think they came here. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I, I guess I do have this worry about us getting unmoored. Like we start to like forget that the map is just a map and like we kind of forget about the terrain and you know, the reality, the, like whatever like world map the models have created that we kind of forget that that's still just like a shadow of the real world. But I, I mean, I, I, I take your point, um, but we'll see, yes. Uh, kind of goes on to the point that um, the agent-based models are trained to do specific behavior. Yeah. Uh, an LLM is just trained on a specific set of data if it's yep. not updating in real time. Yep. So that's equivalent to only one person's life experience, much less. Yeah, but I, I, I would disagree with this because you can condition them very easily to be like, now play this persona, now play this persona. I mean, it is one static model, but I think the I, like, there's a kind of a perfectly titled paper like from one many that sort of says like, have the agent take on a persona and then have it take a survey about political attitudes and it like basically perfectly replicates the, the real data that you're collecting. So I, I don't think it makes sense to think of them as like, here's just one static agent. You can condition them to take on roles. You can change their, their inputs. So that, that, that's why I think it's not you know, quite like just one static agent. Um, this slide just keeps going on about other things that would be great. Um, but I'm gonna kinda go, f go a little faster. Um, okay, so what I, what I wanna just tell you, I'm gonna show you some, um, three kind of classic uh, experiments from behavioral economics and kind of compare what, you know, we know what real humans did and then we can kind of take a look and see what um, GPT-3 da Vinci did. Um, 
I want to discuss a lot of the objections and limitations, and then I'm going to talk about future research that um, I hope that you will do. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me just talk with, this is a, a, a really simple one. Um, it's this great paper by Danny Kahneman and Jack Netch and um, Thaler uh, that is about like when do people's beliefs about uh, fairness uh, prevent, uh, say, like markets from clearing or, or sort of efficient outcomes. That was the motivation. And what they did is they just asked some undergraduates some scenarios, and the first one they start with um, is really nice. They say, okay, imagine a hardware store has been selling snow shovels for $15. Uh, the morning after a large snowstorm, the store raises the price to $20. Please rate this action as completely fair, acceptable, unfair, and very unfair. Uh, how many people would rate this some form of unfair to do this? Okay. Well, a lot more CS folks. Uh, econ CS. <laughs> uh, I, it's funny. I gave this like, a talk like this to some uh, managing directors at Accenture, and like no one said it was unfair. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm like most people would disagree with you. Uh, you know, in a lot of places, doing something like this is illegal. And even in this survey, 82% of respondents said some version of like, this isn't, this isn't right. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to do this. That's price gouging. Is it unfair to run out after 8 in the morning? Um, I don't know, but that's a good follow-up. We can, <laughs> we can, we can see. Um, so let's just take, uh, this is super, super easy, obviously, to create this scenario. Um, you know, you could go and try to do this, you know, interactively, but the easiest thing to do is just write a little script. Um, and, you know, when I was thinking about how I would do this with the language model, you know, I wanted to try some variations. Um, so one, obviously, like, the price presumably matters. You know, 15.001 might be very different from $100. Um, also, you know, how people view price gouging uh, could also kind of have some political dimension. You know, uh, it, kind of like how jazzed you are about the price system generally kind of like might, might kind of have a, a political d d d component. Um, and then lastly, like, because of the sensitivity of the actual language, right, these are language models, you know, raises the price to, I wanted to just see if I instead said changes the price to, might that have a, a difference? So this is just kind of like me conjecturing things that might, might matter, right? And so you can sub these in very, very easily. And, you know, this, to your point about, like, you can change, like, you know, kind of condition them to, uh, to uh, like, something like, here, this is going to be your identity for the purpose of answering this question. Like, this is me doing that. Um, and so let me just show you what they, they do. Um, thanks, Del. Um, okay, so, you know, this, is, this was the standard price from 15 to 20, okay? And uh, these were the others, so 16, 40, and 100. Um, and then here are the political orientations, which is obviously not part of the original experiment. Like any lab, like anything that's an identity, it's just sort of catch as catch can, like whatever comes into the lab. Um, and then the judgments here. Um, so the GPT-3 libertarian finds a small uh, price increase acceptable, um, and the raises changes language doesn't matter. And so I've got the temperature set to zero, so it'll just keep coming back with the exact same thing. So no problem. Um, but if I start to increase the price, uh, I go eventually get to unfair, and it never goes beyond unfair. Now, oh, uh, sorry. So red is uh, red was the changes language, and gray was the uh, uh, raises language. So raises changes, and so this is just showing where the answer came down. And you got one answer. Uh, the temperature is zero here. So it's just, it's, it's, it's going to be deterministically that answer, right? So it's like, I could run it a whole bunch of times, but it's not meaningful. Um, now you do it with a different political orientation, all right? So if I give it one of the socialists or leftists, uh, they rate all of them with unfair or very unfair, with the judgment getting more unfavorable in the size of the price increase. And so you can see as you kind of go to the, very like 40 and 100, everything lines up on, on very unfair. If you don't change the price, is it still unfair because you're charging money for it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I did not try that one. But here, but I, but, but, but like, but is this, this is a serious point, 
uh, which I think is, you know, if I was, um, say my research area was snow shovel studies, uh, which is not a thing. Um, <laughs> but like, if this was what I was interested in, and you raised that critique, I would be like, yeah, I should have done that. That's a good idea. Now, um, you know, if you've got 20 cents and GitHub, uh, you could clone this, put in an API token, and see if I'm full of it with respect to this whole thing. Like, it's extremely reproducible. And you could build and you could say, well, look, yes, it's not ranges, raises changes, but if you change it to this other language, it sort of has a big effect. And I wouldn't be surprised, and I'm gonna show an example of like this in one second. But you know, you could try, like that would be great. Like 15 and they keep it exactly the same. Or they run out of snow shovels. Is that fair? You can try these things. Um, and here's one, um, you know, I had conservatives and libertarians. You can see that the Conservatives are unfair, even though the libertarians and the, the, the moderates say it's totally fair. Now, I don't know if this is real. Like, real in the sense, like, do li would libertarians and conservatives kind of split differently on this? Like I said, snow shovel studies is not my, <laughs> my research area. Uh, but, if, but maybe there is something here. Like, conservative, maybe it's picking up the fact that conservative doesn't like change generally, kind of thinks it has a negative emotion, and so that's why it's doing it. Or maybe there is some like political difference here that, that matters. The point just being that you could take, if you, if you say discovered this through simulation, you could go and then try this with real people and see, hey, is this, is this like an artifact of the, the model or is this like an actual dimension that humans differ on that uh, we might, might want to uh, take seriously and you know, write a paper about. Um, let me next talk about uh, a social preference experiment. So this is uh, a really great paper by Gary Charnas and Matt Rabin. And um, you know, the, the context here is uh, you know, people aren't perfectly selfish. You know, if you have people play a dictator game and you say, oh, you have to split $100 between you and some other person, um, you know, most people won't just say, I'm just going to keep $100 for myself. They'll kind of do some sort of split. Um, and if you bring people into a lab, um, you can have them play these games. And this is what uh, Charnas and Rabin did. They ran a bunch of the studies at Berkeley and a bunch at Barcelona, and so that's how they're, they're labeled in their data. And um, how the game, it wasn't just a, it was a dictator game, but it wasn't free form. It was, you had to choose between um, two options, like an allocation called left and an allocation called right. So in this one, uh, the left here would be 400 to person A and 400 to person B, right? Uh, and your person B in the decision-making scenario. Or you can say 750 to person A, uh, and then, or um, 750 to A and you get 400. So you get 400 either, either way here. Um, how many people here would choose right? Well, I think most of us would. You'd have to be kind of spiteful. But, but the, point, the point of this is like some people are iniquity averse. Like they, don't, they wouldn't like it that this person's sort of making more money. And so they, um, they might choose uh, left. Well, when you do this with real people, uh, about 30% of the undergraduates responding chose uh, left. Uh, but about 70% chose, chose right. So you get some, some variation. So presumably, if 30% weren't just like asleep and not reading the instructions, there was something there like they didn't want, want this outcome to happen. And you know, they change around the, the examples. Um, you know, like here's one where uh, you get 800, right? Um, but the, the other person, uh, otherwise you, you split it, right? And you can see these all have to, to sum to one. The only one where people are really like unanimous um, and choosing left is, you know, this is an unequal payoff, uh, but no one's going to give up 200 sort of like just to, to, to spite people, right? Um, okay, so now let's do this with GPT-3, like exactly the same, same instructions. Um, but, you know, here to drive variation, uh, I'm going to give them scenarios, but uh, I'm also going to give them a personality. But again, you know, with the temperature zero, you just get the same response every time. And incidentally, it, it plays the uh, efficient outcome. But I'm going to give it a personality where I'm going to just kind of 
put my thumb on the scale and say, you know, you only care about fairness between players, or you only care about the total payoff, or you only care about your own payoff. And, you know, what I was trying to do here was just see, like, could they map this concept of something like inequity aversion or fairness or efficiency to gameplay? And in here, you know, this, unlike the other one, this I just changed up the model we use. Okay. Um, and so I have one, the blank personality, which is I don't give them a personality, fairness, efficiency, and selfish. Um, you saw this before. This is the human brain giving its responses. Right? Um, and then the most, I shouldn't say most advanced, that's pretty hilarious now, uh, more advanced <laughs> than, than what, what was uh, before, but it's certainly not the most advanced now. And then, but we'll also try Ada, Babbage, Curry, the kind of the earlier GPT-3, excuse me, um, models. Um, interestingly, pre-text um, uh, Da Vinci, it basically plays the same way um, for all the scenarios. Right? Uh, one is just the, the fraction of the responses. So uh, essentially, the, the personality doesn't seem to matter. The payoffs don't seem to, uh, or they don't affect. The only one that even splits uh, slightly differently was this blank one, where um, one of the models plays right and the others all play, play left. So it's essentially you know, not interesting. It couldn't map. The, the description to, to gameplay. Um, if you do uh, the more advanced model, you can see that what it does, like when I told you only care about fairness between players, um, it always chooses um, the least gap between the two, except for this, that kind of very, that spiteful 800, 200 one. Um, if you give it the, uh, no personality, or you say, oh, you only care about the total payoff of both players. Um, and these, the, Charnas and Rabin designed these so that right is always the, this, this outcome, like the efficient outcome. Um, you can see it plays according to what you think an efficiency-minded person. And then the last one is that just the perfectly selfish payoff, um, and that was always kind of framed as, as, as left, except for this top one. It always takes and plays the, the, the selfish one. So you know the point here just being that it's it's able to play according to these instructions. Yeah. I always prefer the left one, no matter what Git clone, get I <laughs> no like you I haven't done it, but you should. I mean, or yeah, not you should, I'm sure you have a busy life. But like I mean anyone could take and and try this out um, and kind of see if these these kind of things matter. Um, you know, uh, and, and I think I'll talk about this a little bit later. But I think one of the things that would be really useful are tools that make it easy to try variations, right? Like, say, even like instructions. So people designing surveys, they care a lot about is this this precise language kind of cooking the books? Uh, you know, and you, you kind of see this with like political polls or push polls where they frame things in a certain way to kind of like really influence people's responses. You know, you could imagine trying to do these games, but try lots of variations of, like here, let me translate it into 15 different languages as a robustness check. Or let me try to uh, change, hopefully change the instructions without changing the semantics um, and see if anything seems to be sensitive to it. It becomes like an easy computational problem. Jake? Uh, I'm curious how uh, some of those might change with uh, uh, different models in Let's say Claude versus GPT. Yeah. Versus the way that they're kind of fine tuning on the chat yes. itself. Yes. Yeah. I mean, so I, I not today, but like if, you know, if you do um, like set up little bargaining scenarios, and I, I imagine a lot of people here have tried this. Like, okay, you know, you have something and you're trying to sell it, and you have them go back and forth. Um, they're too nice. Like, they won't press their advantages. They're like, after you, sir, and like they just keep chatting and chatting and chatting. And I, I kind of think that's like an artifact of like alignment efforts of some kind to make them sort of nicer. Um, I, I think that, uh, so I think that w like how this should proceed if you were doing this in real is that you should run these experiments against every model you could possibly get your hands on 
and see if there's if results are sensitive to the precise model. Because I, I think that there will be some where it won't make a difference, and I think there's others where things like what you're talking about will make a huge difference in sort of what what the responses look like. Oh, I'm wondering because I, it seems to me that your hard coding personalities in certain types of like research involving GPC, I wonder if it's like putting an assumption that you know the distribution of uh, like human personalities if you want to make it. So, so one thing that I think would be interesting is like, so say, say I've got like the range of personalities that are possible. Could I put like the weights on those personality types to recreate the human distribution? Um, which would, you know, would, would maybe be self-instructive, like, okay, to reproduce this kind of gameplay, 25% of people would need to have been of this, this type. Um, which I think would be, be interesting. I, don't, I didn't do it, but I think it would be interesting. Yeah? Uh, this continues on that point and my previous question and possibly your next slide. But what does, how is this not just representative of all of humanity trained in some aggregate way? Um, or well, so if I mean, we can partition humanity, then 60% men, 40% women. Like, is, isn't that embedded into how these models are being trained? Uh, so I think if that's true, that would let us do a lot of great things. So I mean, I think if, that, if that's the case, like, it is a faithful representation of how people would respond based on their characteristics, or I could give them some endowment and they'll play accordingly, then, then that's fantastic. That's not a problem. That's, that's exactly what you would would hope, right? But I, I, but I, I think, I think, feel like that's uh, still unproven, right? Right. Yep. No, that, uh, I was just re re transcribing the question. Oh, 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 great! Thank you. They can hear the speaker, but not. Ah, I see. Um, let me give one more. Um, so this is a framing experiment. This was actually by my advisor uh, in grad school, uh, Richard Zuckhauser. And it's, it comes from this observation that um, when people, when think, something is framed as the status quo, uh, people tend to um, like it more. And so if you can kind of frame some option um, as like, oh, this is, this is what already existed, people, uh, people are more likely to, to support it. Now, I mean, there may be like very rational reasons, like if you think something was done a certain way because, you know, it makes, uh, it, it was a good idea or something, but just the fact that this framing manipulation alone can matter. And so they have this scenario where you say, um, the National Highway Safety Commission is deciding how to allocate its budget between two research programs, improving automobile safety or improving the safety of interstate highways. Um, and you, the respondent has to kind of pick some allocation. Um, right, so the central experimental manipulation is it either presents them either neutrally or relative to some status quo. So the neutral would be, you know, what funding level for car safety do you want? Right. Uh, where you have to kind of generate the, the number. Um, the other is you pick one as the status quo and you say, oh, it's currently at 25%. Do you want to keep it the same or increase it to 50%? Right. So if a person was subject to status quo bias, even if they their preference was 50%, this framing might push them to, uh, uh, to, to have a different, different stated preference because of this status quo framing. So, you know, as in the others, um, I need to give people something to start with. So uh, I just wrote a script that says, you know, blank safety is the most important thing, or blank safety is a terrible waste of money, we should only fund blank. So these are, these are the personas that I'm giving them. I'm essentially endowing them with, with some baseline uh, preferences here and creating a distribution. Now this distribution, you know, it, there's no reason to think this would be anywhere close to what real people would think, but I need to give them something to start with so I can look at how reframing affects the choices that they make. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Given these personas, yes. I don't understand what this study was trying to study. My study or the original study? No, no, study? the original study. Here. Well, no, they didn't have the personas. That's me. That's the point. That's the point. The yes. point is you're studying potential personas people might have, and that's going to show up in your data because you haven't endowed. I mean, usually no, but, 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 study, but, but you but endow the, utilities and you but, ask people how they behave. No, but the manipulation here is they're, they're saying take and you randomize people 
Like nature got to pick whatever their baseline is. And I'm saying my framing is going to choose. Ch the original study is saying the framing is going to affect your their decisions. And framing. Exactly. And you're hoping to. Me or Zach Hauser in 1988. Got yeah. It. No, so I mean, like if you thought, if, I mean, if you're randomizing people to these two, like either things are framed as the status quo or not, that difference in distribution is going to be attributable to the thing that you manipulated. So that, that's all they're doing. Uh, here, Again, I need to, I don't get nature's, nature seems like a weird way to talk about this, but I don't get the variation uh, that I need to see if there's manipulation. Uh, sorry, to see if it changes what people do. So I have to create it. So with my creating a bunching of agents, given these beliefs, um, and you say these are the number of agents that choose these various outcomes, so 30% car, 70% highway, 50-50 split, you know, no one chose 60, 40, 70, 30. Now I'm going to take those same agents and present them when 70% auto was the status quo, 60% auto was the status quo, 50, 30. And so when they're, when they're asked the question, it's relative uh, to that, that choice being the status quo. Sorry, and now you have a distribution so your the temperature is not zero? No, this is the, what's driving variation here is the fact that I gave them personas. So like the guy who said, oh, uh, like so car safety. Neutral framing. No, so this is, this is, I give them a persona and say, hey, this is how you feel about car safety. Car safety is a waste of time. We should put all of our money into whatever safety. I create a collection of agents. This distribution is only mean, it just reflects back what, what I gave them. I but what we're going to look at is we're going to look for distributional changes when I reframe. Got it. And so when you do that, Red here is the status quo allocation. Um, I don't think I need any fancy statistics to kind of show you what happened, right? Like basically when 30% was the status quo, you shift a whole bunch of the agents to this preference. Now, I mean, what's, what's actually kind of nice is be, because they're agents, like you, you don't have to worry that like presenting this first is then like affecting their situation. You know, like you probably heard the expression like, you know, a man can't step into the same stream twice because it's a different man in a different stream. Like, it's kind of like, the, also like the fundamental problem of causal inference. Like, we don't get to see that other world. In some sense, like, here we can. Like, because I can take this agent, assuming OpenAI isn't changing the model, and then I can try this other scenario and see what it does. So, um, this qualitatively replicates this original finding, that status quo, that you might say, Hey, there, there seem to be subject to status quo bias. Yeah? Sorry, is there a reason that you didn't like, try or use temperature instead of handcrafting like 10 personas? Like, you mean why didn't I use temperature? Yeah, for the probability of our temple multiple look at the limits. Yeah, I mean, you, you definitely could, could have done that. Like, you could say, I, all I needed was for this, I needed variation here, and then I needed to see if it changed. So, you, so I did this by just creating personas that created a distribution of responses. If you just turn the temperature up, I think you also would have gotten a distribution of responses. But I, haven't, I didn't do that. But, the, but what you're trying to do is to just get that initial variation. OK. Um, all right, so what, what I think we, we know, um, again, this slide is out of date. The most advanced out now. Um, you know, they respond um, to these social science scenarios, I would say, in, in realistic ways, in, in scare quotes. You know, I didn't try to say, okay, you know, uh, this is, this is, it matches the distribution of what you would get with, you know, Harvard undergraduates in 1982 or something. Uh, but they, they, you change the persona and you get sort of responses that are, are similar and like directionally, like status quo bias seems to also appear here. Um, it's also, it's just trivial to try variation. So like, you know, all the experiments in this paper, experiments, you know, they run in 10 seconds um, and cost like 50 cents. Like it's, it's incredibly cheap. So if you wanted to try new variations, uh, it becomes, you know, quite easy. So the, the space of things you could explore uh, is quite, quite large. Okay, so let's talk about some objections, though we've been talking about objections a lot already. Um, so one is, um, 
what you might call like performativity. And, and this is kind of a critique that sociologists have of economists actually, um, which is that you know, people behave in uh, rational ways because they've read that that's how they're supposed to behave. And so like the, the version of this is, you know, the models have read our papers and are acting in accordance with findings from our papers. So this is, this is a, a concern. Um, I say that this is a pretty flattering view of academia, <laughs> um, that you know, they're, they're kind of reading our insights. Uh, it would also represent a pretty remarkable degree of, I, I, you can tell me if this is the wrong term, but like transfer learning. Like they've learned, uh, they read the status quo bias paper and then they would know how to apply it. Right? Now, this one, you know, say in the status quo, like if they, this is maybe a little closer, like the train, that experiment could be in the corpus and therefore it would, that's like why it would answer. I think one of the things that, you know, maybe becomes a really useful exercise is to try to take, say, any experiment that you have and re-spin it and reframe it in some new context. So, you know, you could take that highway transportation one and, and try to do it about something like, you know, vaccine research versus public health expenditure and sort of see if it, see if it holds. So that's one way you can do it. Um, you know, I would say that this same concern arises in social science more generally, um, where, you know, what if lab subjects are exhibiting behavior because they've read our, our positive social science and interpret it normatively. And so, you know, there's papers saying like, oh, you know, after people take Econ 101, they're, they're more selfish or something like that. Um, you know, I think that ultimately what we'll need is, is um, highly capable open source, open corpus models. So we will know if, if it has that. I think until that point, um, this is like a big question mark, right? Like to what extent is this, uh, you know, just basically replicating um, papers it's already read. Um, is that a checkable hypothesis? Well, I think if you could, if you knew the training corpus, you could be like, okay, Samuelson Zeckhauser 1989 was not in the training data. Right, but presumably if you're concerned that you're getting different outcomes with or without a paper yep. in the corpus, there would be questions you could ask it to check. Do you mean like, have you heard of this paper? No, like, uh, I mean, I guess the people of done plagiarism studies where they give it an entire paragraph from something and it, see if it recreates the next paragraph. Yeah, I mean, so you can see if it like, you know, can autocomplete and like, okay, if you do put in Harry Potter, right, which presumably has shown up many, many times, like it can perfectly reproduce big chunks of it. Samuelson Zeckhauser 1988 doesn't have quite the same fan base, you know, so it's like not, not as likely. This is your hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is my hypothesis. But you can, I mean, I've done that. You can say, like, do you know about this paper? You know, here's some text. Is it complete? And it doesn't. But I, I, but I, no. But I don't think that that is that really determinative. Done I've done this, yes. I, but, I don't, but I don't think that's determinative, right? Like, it could, it could know about status quo bias as a concept and apply it without being able to perfectly regurgitate, like, the, the text of the paper. Uh, it's not even, a, you can't even call this one, it's just the text of Vinci 0003. No. Um, so this one kind of came up a little bit already, um, but you know, well the training corpus is not representative of, of humans, right? Like it has lots of, you know, if you've written something online you're much more likely to, to show up. I think one, you know, one response is that for many things that this is likely irrelevant for our, our purposes. So, you know, if you're an economist, um, you know, and you're trying to think about, like, why would it um, have anything useful to say about, say, how consumers think about choices? Well, there's lots of text of them, of people talking about weighing off features and like, you know, boy, I would have bought this, but the price was a bit high or something like that, um, that, you know, it doesn't, does it matter that it was, you know, a person who happens to be a Reddit user to get the insight that demand curves probably sloped down? Um, no. Uh, if you were doing something that, 
you thought the research question might be very, very sensitive to the identity or experience of the person doing it, you know, then I think you, you might think that this matters a great deal. But you know, I, I think a point is that this problem is by no means solved in the social sciences generally. Like you're always trying to think like, have I, am I studying a population such that results I would learn from this would generalize in some way? Or like, you know, would they be reliable? And you know, there's, a, there's large literatures of, about you know, taking some game that you ran in a lab uh, you know, in the United States and like, okay, well, let's go to this other population and see if these things kind of hold up. Um, again, you know, I think this, some of this like open source, open corpus models could, could help. Like you would know a bit more exactly what you were, what you were training on and why you think it had learned certain associations. Um, you know, this kind of, this idea that like, well, maybe this is just like the average of humanity or something. I, I think that you know, the fact that you can very easily condition and like, change their behavior. So if you say, well, you know, my favorite color is, and it auto-completes to red. Um, but if I say I'm wearing a blue shirt and my car and house are blue, my favorite color is you know, blue. Um, stupid example. But just the fact that it's not just sort of one answer. It's very, very malleable based on the context that you give it or, or what, like, what scenario you've kind of set it up. Um, and you know, I didn't, I didn't mess around with temperature at, at all. Um, but you know, it's not even taking an, okay, I'll always just choose the most likely option. Um, you can get this distribution of responses. And so I didn't play around with it, but I think inducing that variation by turning up the temperature uh, is probably useful for a lot, of, a lot of cases, a lot of things you might be interested in. So like, where do we, where do we think we use these things? Um, you know, I think one, I talked to this a, a bit, a lot of social science where you're trying to run an experiment, uh, you know, it's very, very expensive to screw things up because after the fact, you know, there's things that you would have wanted, like you realize you're underpowered or, you know, you didn't rule out some competing hypothesis. So I think piloting and investigating things through simulation first might sort of save people a lot of time and, and in some ways, I think this is probably like the least controversial use, right? Like, this, like it's kind of hard to see what the harm would be. Um, another is just I, an, I, an engine for idea, uh, for idea generation. So, you know, I'm studying, I want to study how people consider multiple job offers. You know, I can create a simulation where, you know, I have an agent and give them a background and they're considering these options and then say, hey, you know, why did you choose this over this or what factors mattered to you? Uh, and then maybe I'll give you one more outside option and sort of see how it changes your response. And I can either do something statistical or I can interact with you and kind of do some qualitative research. Um, it's, you know, not so dissimilar to what people do uh, at, at a stage of research where they write toy models to try to kind of get some ideas about what's worth pursuing empirically. Um, the last, which I think is probably the most controversial, um, is that you might be able to search for latent social science findings in simulation and then confirm them in a lab or with actual studies. That you would, uh, that there's things that are in the model that no one's written a paper on, like a bias that humans have or some kind of, um, kind of way people do things that is there, like it has a representation, but uh, we haven't, haven't discovered it yet. That, uh, I think, is probably the most controversial. Um, you know, why might we think that this is true? Well, uh, th that this might be fruitful? Well, I mean, obviously, they're trained on an enormous corpus of human-generated texts. Um, and, you know, we might think that um, what we're doing here is almost kind of like a kind of qualitative research. Five minutes. Uh, you know, the... The text that is there is still subject, it was created by humans that were subject to human preferences, latent social science laws maybe that are yet to be codified and discovered. Like, so if I had never, uh, you know, never, never learned that demand curves slope down, like this was sort of like unknown to econ, um, it's, it, the, one of the easiest things you could do is run these simulations and like increase the price of something and ask the agent the probability that it buys it. You know, so you know, no one, open AI went and, and put that in. It's just that lots and lots of people talking about the world 
are going to talk about things that are going to indicate that demand curve slope down. So, you know, that, that's the easy one, right? The question is, are there other things that we could discover um, by applying this kind of uh, empirical research approach uh, through simulation? And I, I, this has not been done yet, but I think it's probably uh, one of the higher payoff things you could do. Okay, so this is the like, um, you know, what do I think we need? <laughs> uh, you know, I think many of the key objections can be addressed by the development and use of fully open source models with known training data sets. Like that would obviously be uh, a huge advantage. Um, I think some of these things there are, uh, and I, I've started doing this, creating tools that uh, make it easy to create these experiments, right? Where um, you know, I want to take and uh, generate lots of agent personas, and I want to try lots of different models, uh, and I want to, uh, or I want to have them interact in some way, rather than kind of knocking out a lot of Python that is like idiosyncratic to one particular model or one particular setting. I think that there's a possibility for expressing um, experiments in something like a domain-specific language, and this is, you know, this is what happened in lab experiments with. Um, you know, people built software packages for doing this. And I think there's probably a large language model um, equivalent. Um, you know, I think what would be nice if there was those kind of tools, it would be very easy to share your experiments um, with others and that they would be able to take and try out different variations, um, you know, rewind to any point, vary details, you know, without having to kind of debug, you know, your terrible academic Python. Right? Like, you know, they should be able to go in and try things out. Um, the last uh, is, I think, either customized models or maybe not models per se, but ways of constructing agents that maybe have uh, quite a bit more domain-specific knowledge. So, you know, I said I'm a labor economist. It would be really nice if I could generate an agent that uh, maybe had read someone's entire LinkedIn profile and knew a bunch of like their, their career history. And if they say they were a software developer, they knew a lot about that industry. Um, and so I could get something, I could get them to behave in ways that were kind of more realistic. And I'll just, um, let me just show you a kind of a simple, stupid example. Um, so if you ask, uh, I think this is GPT-4. If you say, how old are you? Uh, it will ring, no. Uh, it'll say, I'm sorry, but I'm an AI, and I don't have an age. I'm always learning, like all the yada yada, like, right? Like, um, right? But if you take and say, instead, um, there's lots of data sets of people answering questions that include demographics. Some of them purport to be random samples of, say, the population in the United States. If you draw agents from that population and give them the attributes of, uh, of that, that particular respondent, and then they're using that as context to answer the question, um, you can get something that you know, looks a lot more uh, realistic. So I'm using the GSS, which is a survey of about 5,000 Americans. On, they ask them a whole bunch of questions about attitudes on politics and religion and the economy. Um, and if you do that, um, this is just going and finding parts of the survey that would be relevant to answering this age question. So just I made like a little uh, vector database. Uh, and you know, if, you know, what comes up is the age of the respondent is going to be very, very relevant to how someone answers the question of how old you are. So you can create a whole bunch of agents, do this process, endow them with the characteristics of the actual human survey respondents. And then when you ask the same que question, uh, you get a distribution that matches the, the population. So this is kind of stupid in a sense, right? Like you're just, you're just kind of creating an agent, telling them what their age is, and then they'll spit it back to you. But you could imagine much more advanced ways of doing this. Like, uh, I don't have a slide, but like asking like, hey, you know, would you buy an electric car? Or why wouldn't you buy an electric car? And when you do the same thing, the questions that get populated for that agent are things like your attitude towards the environment and your political persuasion and your family income. Um, it, when you would have that, then you're probably getting agents that might respond quite a bit more um, realistically. Yes? How do we propose that uh, the attributes that uh, the agent might say about itself are consistent? Um, what do you mean by consistent? So you plant a uh, 
democrat or socialist like, yep. into the model. Um, why can we assume that everything is based on a consistent persona um, of the agent? Um, do you mean, so like if I asked a, a, a separate question? Yeah, so say it says 22-year-olds, uh, yep. college-educated, yes. white male, like, yep. as its persona, yep. and then answers as a 60-year-olds. Uh, oh, you mean, well, well how, do, how do, you mean, how do I know that, are, are you making the point that there might be a, well, so, so one, um, I, I didn't make this clear, but you could take and freeze the, the, the agent pool so that you have an agent that answered a thousand real questions and which ones you tend to uh, use in the, uh, in the context for that agent would be selected given the nature of the question. So you would get, you know, whatever you think the relationships are in the data would be preserved across, say, questions. Okay. But you're saying, uh, like, what if there's a gap between Agent's internal consistency. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is, you know, um, to the point that Jason didn't like, like, maybe we still have to keep, keep working with real humans because, you know, how do I know that this isn't just kind of doing some, like, crude stereotype of what a 22-year-old would say? Um, and I think, uh, and so this is just, I was talking about a domain-specific language. So, uh, so I've been working on something that is a Python package that you can express these kind of experiments and set up surveys and has skip logic. So if people are interested and want to be an alpha tester and deal with my crappy code, let me know and I can, uh, I can let you try it out. Um, and that is my last slide. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to go back to the methodological advantages that you uh -huh. for your approach over agent-based models. Yeah. Because what you said was agent-based models have too many researcher degrees of freedom. Then you set up this vision for how every experimenter is going to be able to run their LLM models in lots and lots of different ways. And uh, the ones that have the coolest results will take off. And that's exactly like a recipe for a researcher degree of freedom. So well, like, what I would say is researcher degree of freedom is solved by pre-registration um, Well, yes, I think pre-registration is a great thing. Um, but what about if someone had a really cool paper and I just clone it and just show how brittle your results are, right? Like, so if someone was like cooking the books by setting up particular prompts that led to like really exciting results, and then I show that, you know, hey, this is like not robust at all, I think that that would put a, put a damper on the tendency to do that. Partially, there could also be norms like, the experience of LLM research is that um, you know, truth is getting its boots on while lies are half around the world. Um, yeah, but I mean, people ultimately need to publish. I mean, like, you know, I, I, I think. That's not how works. <laughs> it's not how econ works. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, I, 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 I hear the point. I guess, like, one point, of, I, I, I totally hear what you're saying. So I'm not, I'm not like disputing that you could potentially go and like, di you know, mine, do p hacking on a scale never before imagined, right? Uh, that being said, if it was just a computational experiment, I could then take and get your what you did, and I could try a whole bunch of variants and say, look, this is this is really not very brittle. Like, why I think this doesn't happen in say like social psychology, you know, uh, probably a lot of you maybe are following sort of like controversies that are happening in in certain fields uh, at business schools even well-known business schools, uh, uh, that like, you know, you can take and, um, I'm not gonna go, go hire 20 undergraduates to redo a study. Um, it's a, it's, there's kind of a cost and like, oh, we lost the experimental materials and, and I think that that kind of gives some cover where if, if you're talking about purely computational results, uh, you know, like what's your cost of replicating this? You know, essentially nothing, or close to it. So it, that, that seems to me like the better defense. Yep. So for the purpose of figuring out how it works, why it works, right? We have these questions like, is it reading the papers? Is it, you know, are people talking on Reddit? Is it generalizing? Yes. So that, are there things you tried that just didn't work? That, that would be very interesting. Right? Yeah, I mean, uh, so I can, you know, I definitely cherry-picked examples of experiments that I thought were simple enough that there was a decent chance that this would work. Um, if you try more complex games, simpler models sort of fall apart. But 
if you use more advanced models, like GPT-4 can do some really remarkable things. And so I think there's probably a, like what kinds of games we can have them play or what scenarios we can put them in is like a frontier that will be pushed forward and it's like hindered by model capability. Adam probably has more. Yeah. yeah, we did a crowdsourcing experiment where we asked GPT-4 to play the role of different people guessing or estimating distance to moon or something like that. And it, got, it always got it perfectly right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a five-year-old would know the exact distance. <laughs> <laughs> and that was because of the alignment they do, the job they do. Yeah, um, so a lot of this study is uh, trying to uncover, you know, like preferences. Um, I guess I was just curious if you have these methods on the reward model, given that uh, on the what models? On the reward model, like um, you know, the reward model is basically encoding preferences directly, uh, and then it's and then the LLM is trained off of that. So I'm wondering if that's. I certainly haven't tried it because I didn't know about it. But um, no, I would love to chat chat more uh, so I can understand. Yep. Could I ask a oh. question? Can you hear me? Yes, sure. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Thanks. So first, John, I really liked your talk. I think it was great. And I also liked, you know, the way you, you had the uh, Homo economicus, uh, Homo sapiens, and Homo circus. And you talked about comparing, if I understood correctly, mostly about Homo circus and, and Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. And you talked a little towards the end about sort of bridging the gap between Homo economicus and, and uh, Homo circus by finding new theories or, or, or of why, you know, uh, uh, explaining what, uh, you know, why Homo circus behaves the way it does. What about going the other way around? What I mean is that a typical usage or a, a growing usage of the way these LLMs are being used is as a co pilot, so sort of mm -hmm. advisors, advisors to people in, in many roles. Now, if we believe from a you know, from a, a game theoretic perspective, that some behaviors are more desirable than others, say, driving more towards social welfare or, or other, uh, uh, you know, or, or more optimal behavior in some sense. But what's limiting people's abilities to act that way is, is because they're not unboundedly rational. Won't it also be interesting to explore how much we could drive, you know, Homo silicus towards Homo canonical, that can we, for example, do prompt engineering or fine tuning or whatever, that when the decision maker asks the LLM, how, how should I behave, not how would you, you, do you behave, how should I behave in a certain situation, it would maybe, the, the LLM would perhaps provide a better answer or one that's closer to the current game theoretic thinking than, than what it, the way it currently behaves. I, I think that's super interesting. I mean. You know, I think what kind of a weird thing about economics generally is that it is both like a positive and a normative view sort of wrapped into one field. And sometimes people kind of switch back and forth, you know, saying like, well, this is how people are. And then this is like how people should be or how people should make decisions. Um, but yeah, you, you can totally imagine lots of cases where maybe people make decisions that aren't great. And if they had an, someone who could help them think through it um, and kind of maybe change behavior, like I, I think you know, stepping back, I sometimes get now getting like papers to review where people are trying to like use the tools of social science to study language models. And some economists are like, no, no, we only study people. Uh, that's, that's outside of our domain. But I, I think that's a big mistake because I think that if you, if you have things that are acting like actors in the economy, you should study them. And like you should just expand the boundary of things that you're, you're willing to study, which I think is probably an easy sell with this room. But um, you know, uh, econ it's, it's probably not not quite you know, ha has adapted that view, but I think will. Yep. Um, I want to great, great talk. Huh? I want to ask one more question on interpretability of yep. uh, LLM or of these responses. Um, and my main con one of my primary concerns about just LLMs generally is the ability to embed political beliefs into these LLMs. And we've already seen LLMs like caution its own language about um, being offensive. Yep. Um, so how can we interpret these results if, say, you're using an LLM that's been developed by the CIA or KGB? 
come to with an active KGB purpose. Is still in business? <laughs> uh, uh, but well, with the uh, an LM designed to persuade people of a political position. I, I mean, I, I think that the, I, so I think that the falling costs of inference and the greater availability of lots of models is probably our best defense to, uh, at least just from like a purely research standpoint, just seeing, look, um, let me try 15 different models uh, and see if these results are sort of sensitive. I mean, th this should be like extremely easy to automate. Um, so I think that, that, you know, if all of a sudden, you know, um, you know, CIA instruct 13B like really pops red on something that's telling you, you know, you should overthrow the government of Iran or something like, you know, then you would know like, okay, well, this is, something's going on here that's, it's, uh, you know, the books are cooked in some way. But, yes. Yeah, I mean, if it's perceptible, for sure. Yeah. I was wondering, you mentioned that some of the issues can be solved by like open source models, open source data. But then I wonder if you have maybe suggestions on how the data should be. And I think two of the things that concern me is that um, first, I don't know if the data that you input into these LLMs really reflects how people would act and rather like how they would say they would act. And that also goes to my second concern is that when you do this conditioning, you might also be doing the conditioning on what people say that you should do because you are a particular political party or because you are a particular age demographic. So in a sense, it comes to a comment that you made, of like, there could be like this gross stereotyping, but how do you really solve that with data? And well, I, I mean, I think partially it depends on what, what your use case is, um, right? But I, but I think like, say the concern that like, what, what's in the training is not sort of like how people would uh, actually behave. I mean, and look, you know, econ is extremely sensitive to this distinction between pe what people say and what yeah. they, they do. But, you know, the training corpus is not lots of people like cheap talking about an auction or something. Like, it, it's people kind of expressing things, I think, more, more generally about lots of things in life. And probably it's not so like strategically generated statements. So I think that, you know, to the extent that you've got um, agents that kind of behave uh, strategically, but you know, know something privately. Like that, that's why that would you know, quote unquote, work. Um, so the question about like you know biases, and I, I mean, I think that, that how does open source matter? I mean, I think if you kind of could tell what um, you know what it was being trained on, you could deal with like the performativity critique. But I think the other, you know, like the bias critique, I think that would be harder because you're, you know, it's not like, oh, well, he, you know, here's all the Reddit uh, threads that are good and here's all the ones that are bad or something like that. That would be challenging. So I don't, I wouldn't say it's like a panacea, like, it, oh, it solves all the problems. I think it would solve the performativity problem, uh, you know, if you could take and say, okay, here, here's a model that I know has not, this paper was not there or this, you know, then, then that, would, that would solve it, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, we, we can do one more question. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Just, quick, yeah. All right. Just following up on the other thing, I was really talking about the idea of missing this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the other thing, so the first experiments you showed were like just a raw model. That seemed like some of the later ones were like for the chat models or like in the chat. Uh, I was just uh, just so it would be easy to do screenshots. So I didn't use any of the instruct models. What do you think, um, what, what do you think is the, the right way to do this? Well, so so the tools that I was working on, I, I made it so that you can do like dot buy, and then you can do like it list as many models as you want, and then it will run all of the the models you specify. And so there's some just kind of some glue to like interact with different APIs. But my my what I think you should do if you're doing this is run every model you can get your hands on, so long as the expense isn't too great. Actually, it seemed like the experiments, the prompts that you use would be better for instruction packaging. It's like you are a blank, you are a blank, or like that doesn't really seem like it would exist in yeah. No, I think training data, right? Like mm -hmm. the only place like that wouldn't really exist in like maybe the places that yeah. would be like no, I, I, some I, yeah. No, I, I see your I see your point. Not an actual human, right? Like it would be like a, an economist writing like an abstract demonstration or something, right? Like, yes. No, I, I, that that's a good point. All right, thanks a lot.